Hey guys, welcome back. Hope life is treating you well. And man, what a difference a couple of green days make in the market. The past month has been pretty good to us relative to the rest of the year, up 6%. Even the past week, up 3.5% across the broad S&P 500. And my portfolio over the past month is up a little bit over 4%. And oddly enough, if we see where that return is coming from, the majority of it, 6.6%, is from my dividend investments. Relative to that, my growth and technology assets are up only 2.5%. It's been much more shaky. They've had periods of time where they go up a lot, but other times where they go down a lot. And that's why in the past 30 days, only a net positive of 2.4. And then my combo of the S&P 500 with XYLD is somewhere in the middle of 3.7% not including dividends. And I actually want to use this as an opportunity to talk about uh, dividend investing. So a lot of people have this stigma that dividend assets are always going to underperform the benchmarks. So we can see here the S&P is in blue and Divo is in yellow. And clearly the market has done a lot better over the past five years. But there's two things I want to point out here. The first, if I come back to my portfolio, we can see here that I am very well diversified. I am not just a dividend investor. I also have growth assets along with the S&P 500 itself. So I think that mixture is important, but if you want a high dividend yield, you can still achieve that through this diverse approach. Now, my second and major point that I wanna make is this graph is misleading, especially when it comes to income assets, because this simply represents the price fluctuations over time, not the total return. To understand the total return, we need to utilize a calculator like this, which shows you the total return with dividends reinvested. And yes, I will leave this link down below if you guys wanna use it yourself. But real quick, before we go to all of the results, I do wanna say that generally over long periods of time, growth assets do return slightly more than income assets. I mean, that's the whole point of those investments, but there are trade-offs mostly high levels of volatility. And one advantage of dividend and income assets is that during these volatile times, they really close the gap on those growth assets. Okay, but getting to the data now, this first set of graphs is based around the S&P 500. The one on the left is ticker SPY, so just the S&P 500. The one in the middle is XYLG. And as we can see up top here, this is a systematic income slash covered call fund based off of the S&P 500. And then finally, we have JEPI, which is similar to XYLG. It's focusing on income, but it takes an active approach with managers. Uh, in terms of the time frame, XYLG is the youngest ETF. So the inception date is what I set as the start date for all of these. And that actually really works out in our benefit because we get to see how these ETFs perform in both a bull market and a bear market. So during this time, the S&P 500 had a return of 8.2%. XYLG, the systematic income fund, 8.18%. And then finally, JEPI, which is actively managed, a little bit more, 9.7% return. So this proves that income assets don't have to perform at least substantially worse than the market. I mean, yes, it's true that during the first half of this, the bull market, they might have lagged the market a little bit. But since then, as we're going to a new cycle, they are quickly closing the gap. Now, moving on, I do want to put Jeppy and Divo against one another here. I've been seeing a lot of people in the comments saying that they're dropping Divo and going to Jeppy. And of course, you can do whatever you want. But I do want to point out that since the inception date of Jeppy, Divo has a better total return at 15.4% versus 11.6% for Jeppy. Now here I did the same thing as I did above, but with the QQQ index. The time frame here is a lot more compressed because JEPQ is a lot younger of an ETF. And here we can see the QQQ in this time frame is down 27%, QYLG down 22%, and JEPQ down 20%. Now this data is actually very useful. So clearly JEPQ is a little bit less volatile than both QYLG and QQQ itself. But remember, volatility goes in both directions. So yeah, the QQQ is down 27% this year, but back in 2020, it was nearly up 27%. And in that scenario, you can then imagine how QYLG would be up 22% and then JEPQ would have the worst performance up only 20% 
in that hypothetical scenario. But right now in 2022, we are in a bear market, and this is where these income assets could really thrive and potentially close the gap from previous years. And just to hammer this home, I removed JEPQ from this simulation, again, because the inception date is so young. So this gives us a more broad look. So that leaves us with just QILG and the NASDAQ during both good and bad times. And the funny thing here is the total return is almost identical between these two ETFs, even though one is pure growth and the other is half based on income. So you can imagine that over the long run, 10, 15 years, as we go through multiple cycles of bull markets and bear markets, that at least some income assets that are high quality, like QILG and JEPQ, that have a component of growth in them, might end up having similar total returns to their benchmark. Now again, I do want to stress that diversification is your friend. Have both dividends and growth assets if you want. But hopefully that helped to dismiss the myth that dividend income assets are always going to have worse performance than growth assets. That's simply just not always true, especially when we leave bull markets and we enter more challenging conditions. But let me know what you guys think of this topic in the comments below. If you guys are still watching and enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.